I trust that most of you at least have a passing interest in either Australian freshwater fish or Australian deserts because otherwise it's possibly going to be the longest half hour of your life. <laughs> What I'm going to try to talk about today in about 20 minutes is just a summary of the work that I've been doing out in the arid zone over the last seven or eight years. Um, it's not the most earth shattering work in the world, but it's reasonably exotic and weird and interesting. And I think that's probably, you know, hopefully that will get you over the line if you have no interest in Australian freshwater fish or deserts. As my editor says, fish are not sexy. But I will try my hardest to prove her incorrect. So if you look on the map, <coughs> the area in the square and then the little inset square thing of me, they're, they're the rivers where, where I've been working. And they're, they're, they're what we call arid zone rivers. And they run intermittently. And what that means is that they're not like the Murray River. They're not one big stream all the way down. They're a series of water holes most of the time, except for when they flood. They're really interesting places. And all of those rivers drain down into Lake Eyre in a big flood. So that's why we call it the Lake Eyre Basin. So you may have heard of the Murray-Darling Basin, if you're, unless you've been living under a rock for the last 500 years. This, today we'll be mainly concentrating on the Lake Eyre Basin. But of course, I did not begin in the Lake Eyre Basin. I began, like most people, just dangling lines on the east coast of Australia and developed this interest in things to do with fish, which apparently are not sexy. And um, one thing led to another, and in, back in those days there were no mobile phone or internet, so what we used to do on the weekend, instead of going to parties and meet girls, we just used to pack up and go fishing, um, which was, you know, we thought it was pretty exciting. That's where I started this, this rather interesting journey, I suppose. And then we took it to an extreme a few years later, and myself and a mate decided that we would go and explore an unexplored river in the Kimberley, uh, which was a kind of a weird idea for two 22-year-old people to do. And a whole lot of things went wrong, and we ended up actually being stuck out there for a month longer than we thought. Um, and fishing came in handy because it actually allowed us to stay alive. So there's a th you can see the theme developing somewhat. And we even got a medal from Dick Smith, who I can assure you is a short man, um, <laughs> for doing this particular very stupid thing. It got written up in his magazine and all the rest of it. The problem with doing this kind of thing when you're 22 is that you can't then just go back to a normal life and get a normal job because you're already a weirdo. So I tried to go back to having a normal life, uh, which lasted about six months. And then I ended up in a place called Lake Cajelago, which is smack bang in the middle of the Murray-Darling Basin, which is, as we all know, one of the more stuffed up river systems in the world. Back then, I'd been used to catching fish when I was growing up and then to stay alive in the Kimberley and various other things. And I actually was teaching music at Lake Cajelago. I wasn't fishing. Um, and we did what all people do who move to a small country town, because everybody else around you is doing this. So we had children. And we ended up in a little farm on the side of this wonderful big lake. And then life was quite idyllic. And then the drought the big millennium drought, the big scary drought hit. And that's when I started to think a lot more carefully about this whole Murray-Darling Basin and what the, what the problems were around it. Because the big beautiful lake that we lived on, every now and again, would suddenly become a great big muddy expanse of nothing. And that's when I seriously sort of started getting involved in all this fishy business again. And when I started getting involved in all the fishy business again, the thing I realised was that that big lake and that whole system was overrun by introduced species, or what, what us boffins like to call alien species, which sounds slightly more sinister. So this is, the, this is a carp. This is a Lake Kajeligan carp. 
you'll notice he's about 70 centimetres long and that particular waterway, when it's got water in it, is absolutely chocker full of them. And so I was thinking to myself, that can't be very good. There's also, it's also chocker full of a fish called a redfin, which is also an introduced fish. And a redfin is a more predatory fish. Than, I hope people like fish pictures, because let me tell you, there's, <laughs> there's bootloads more. I mean, I can, I can talk fish all day. It's so exciting. Um, so the, a redfin perch, you know, it'll, it'll actually eat other fish. Carp actually don't eat other fish. They just stir up the bottom and make a mess. So these guys were also overrunning the lake. And even goldfish, this is actually a goldfish, but when goldfish go back into the wild, they, they're not orange anymore, they revert to this colour and they are also overrunning the lake. And then there's this small fish called gambusia, which is also an exotic fish, sometimes called a mosquito fish. And they were everywhere as well. There are a few native fish in there as well, sort of gasping underneath all this stuff, sort of going, you know, I'm still here. But overwhelmingly, and throughout a lot of the Murray-Darling Basin, we have this huge problem with invasive species all over, the, all over the place. So it struck me that you could keep working in that Murray-Darling Basin and you could keep looking at all these horrible things and how terrible everything was for your whole life and career and you'd still be pulling carp out at the end of it. And I thought to myself, that's probably not the most exciting thing to do. But it did make me think of something else, which was, what were these systems like before all this rubbish? What was it like before we put in the big dams? What were they like before we started pulling all the water out? What were they like before we started introducing all these species that aren't actually meant to be there? The problem in inland Australia is that there are precious few waterways that are actually in anything like that state. Believe me, I went looking for them all over the place. The only place where they are is out in the Lake Air Basin. And the only reason that they're out in the Lake Air Basin and that they haven't been stuffed up yet is because it's really, really hot out there, quite a long way from anywhere. Nobody wants to live there. And the only thing that you can really do with the country out there if you want to um, make any money off it to produce stuff is grow cattle on nice big stations. Or you can run them as conservation reserves like Bush Heritage. Or you can mine the bejesus out of them if you wish to, and that seems to be the next big problem. But <clears throat> over the next little while, once I found these places, we started working throughout this Lake Air Basin. And on the map before, I've just listed the rivers there if anybody's interested going from sort of east to west. They're the rivers uh, where I've done most of this work. So. We spent a heap of time out there sampling fish in you know, dry season, wet season, floods, and we went all the way across from the Bulu, which is roughly near Quilpie, uh, all the way across to the border. So yeah, lots of diesel and lots of, um, lots of broken things, but you know, generally a good time. And the big question for me is, and always will be, and I think it's actually more of a quest um, is to work out why the bloody hell, if you're a fish, would you live here? Where most of the time there's nowhere to live, occasionally it's really, really good. But why would you do it, and more, more importantly, how would you do it? So I'm just going to take five minutes of your lives now and show you a whole lot of pictures of fish. The reason I'm doing that is because I'm assuming that there are at least four people in the audience who are fish nuts. There always are. Um, I'm not sure who they are. It's hard to pick from the faces. There's a couple there, I think. So if you hate fish and you're not interested, just think about something else for the moment, like what you've got to do this afternoon. But I'm just going to give you a really quick rundown on what lives where in the Lake Air Basin rivers. It'll be quick, trust me. First up, there are these fish that live all over those rivers in every single one of them. One of the most common fish in Australia, and it's called a bony brim, and it looks like that and it eats algae and detritus, and pelicans eat them, and so do cormorants, and so does every other water bird that eats fish. Without these fish, they're like a little herring. They get to about that big. And without them, Australian ecosystems would just grind to a shuddering halt, and everything would stop. They really are the engine room. There are these other little ones called rainbow fish, and they're very colourful, but they only get to about that big. 
and we find them all over the place as well. There are these slightly larger ones called spangled perch which get to that big and they are a really aggressive sort of beast. And they're the ones that you hear falling in rains of fishes and crawling up wheel ruts and all kinds of interesting accoutrements. And then there are these little ones called glassfish, which only get to about 50 centimetres long and strangely are translucent. Now these four species, let me tell you, are the toughest fish in Australia. We've found them at the base of sand dunes, way up 300 kilometres from the closest permanent water and it's just amazing the places they will go uh, in their vain and strange attempt to stay alive in the Australian arid zone. There are also, nearly as tough, are two species of catfish. You sort of normally think of catfish as these weird little things that grub along the bottom of the water hole, but these ones actually school and they swim in the mid-water. The one on the uh, left is called a silver tandan, and the one on the right is called a hurtles tandan, for those who are interested. There are slightly, and as we get into these bigger fish, now these, both of these are a species of grunter, which is related to silver perch, I'm just talking to the fish people now, that live in Victoria. I'm like, I know, I know, it's exciting, I know, it's, it's great. Um, who said fish weren't sexy? Um, and they're also related to sooty grunter further up in the north, if you're interested in these kinds of things. And these fish get to around about that big, and when they are in plentiful supply back in the dim, dark, distant past, you can imagine they would have been a staple food for um, Aboriginal people all the way through that part of the country. The biggest fish out there that's widespread is, is a yellow belly or a golden perch or a callop, depending where you're from, and they look like that and they get even bigger. And again, same story, they certainly would have supported um, large numbers of people back in the day. Now for those of you who are slightly interested in fish but more interested in what we might call biogeography or where things are. One of the interesting things about this part of the world is that in the eastern rivers, like the Cooper Creek system, so that goes down through Windora and ends up, you know where it, you know where it goes, up there, crosses the border and then goes into South Australia, in a minka, that's the place I'm trying to think of. We get these fish which we more usually associate with the east coast. So the top one's called a gudgeon, the bottom one's called a smelt. But they come from east coast rivers and somehow or other they've just made it as far as the Cooper but not very much further. There's also another really big weird looking catfish that lives in, Coop, in Cooper Creek only and it, because it only lives there we call it an endemic species. This is a really interesting beast called a Cooper Creek catfish for obvious reasons. Um, they get really large and the interesting thing about them is that we can't really work out what they're related to. So we think that they're a relic species from a long way back that has just been literally left in these strange water holes out on Cooper Creek. Um, so in terms of conservation, they're a priority. And there are western species that only occur in the western half of those rivers, so out in the Georgina River, out near the Territory border, and we think that they've come down from the Gulf of Carpentaria and got into the basin that way. Top one's called a banded grunter, the bottom one's called a golden goby. There are these little fish called hardyhead, which school in their thousands and they've been reported dying on the shores of Lake Eyre. We found them for the first time in Queensland in a river right on the edge of the desert, which is really interesting because what all this stuff suggests is that when floods occur and times are good, most of these fish species will migrate possibly thousands of kilometres, but we've demonstrated hundreds of kilometres into suitable habitat and also into unsuitable habitat. So the whole way the desert works, if you like, is on these floods, and where the animals can go when those migration pathways open. Another interesting aspect of the whole sort of uh, the whole thing is that they can breed all the time, most of them. So unlike that, unlike we normally associate flooding with fish spawning and this sort of stuff, but out in the desert we're finding that they actually breed all the time, just in case there's a flood. We're thinking so that they can opportunistically make usage of that of that migration pathway. As I said. The reason we start, I started working out here was to work out how these systems worked without all the stuff-ups. There are a few stuff-ups. Goldfish do occur in Cooper Creek. There's a few there, not many. Gambusia, they do occur. 
I'll talk about them a little bit more in a minute. But what we think is there's not that many of them there and they don't seem to get going so well. And we think this is because the, the native fauna is actually still intact in those water holes and that they can possibly regulate these aliens to some degree. We're not sure, but it's a question for somebody to try and resolve later on. One of the biggest problems and threats that we've got in the backcountry though, or the, that, that bit of the world, is what we call translocated species. So these are animals that they're native to Australia, but they're not native to that area. So with yellowbelly, for example, because everybody wants to catch a yellowbelly, all the caravanners and grey nomads, I mean, they drive you nuts wanting to catch yellowbelly, actually. But um, so what happened is they've imported all these fingerlings from hatcheries on the Murray and the Murrumbidgee. They've carted them up to Longreach. I imagine 95% of them are dead. But the 5% that survive get released, and then that, of course, can alter the genetic makeup of the animals that actually live in that system. So that's a problem. They tried the same thing with Murray cod. Um, didn't work so well because it's a bit hot out there. But um, people were still catching cod 10 years after they introduced them. And this was the government did this. It was one of their more creative... Queensland government. <laughs> yeah, she'd be right, mate. No worries. You want to catch cod? No, I want marlin. We'll give you some marlin. Um, and aquaculture has produced a few introductees as well. So this is called a sleepy cod. It's an east coast species. We don't want them in the lake air basin, but unfortunately they're there. One of the biggest problems or looming problems out there is actually a crayfish called red claw, which is a Queensland animal it's from, you know, up around the Cape. They've introduced them and now they're displacing the native yabbies. So it's just that same old story of you know, and if you know anybody who's a mad keen fisherman, just tell them to leave their live bait at home if they want to go out there. OK, that's all the rivers. In that... Oh, dear, I don't want to wreck the thing. Uh, in that area, the Lake Air Basin, there are also these really interesting great artesian basin spring complexes. OK, so what they look like is roughly a bit like this. And they're areas where the water from the Great Artesian Basin upwells through faults in the earth and expresses itself on the ground. The most interesting thing about these areas is that everything that lives there is endemic. Same as that Cooper Creek catfish I talked about before. So if you go to a spring complex and you're interested in plants or snails, you will be fascinated by what you find there. So, uh, for example, at, at, at uh, the Bush Heritage... I'll just get my pointer. At the Bush Heritage Property Edge Basin, which is there-ish, there are up to 14 species of endemic snails. And if you're a lucky person like me, you get to sit in front of a microscope with thousands of these 14 species of snails, all of which are not much bigger than a pinhead, and try to sort them out from one another. The end result is quite a lot of swearing and you just, by the end of the day, you can't really tell which ones you've done and which ones you haven't done. <laughs> but it's all right because it's all in the name of science. The biggest problem, or the, the, the most exciting animals that, that actually live in these springs, I would argue, humbly, um, are fish. And again, the story of these fish is something else because you've got to think that these spring complexes are totally isolated in the world. Everything that lives there has evolved only there. Uh, so at Edgebaston, our probably most famous species is the redfin blue eye. Tiny little fish gets to about three centimetres long. Uh, we're not exactly sure what went on in the dim, dark, distant past, but these guys have evolved to live only there. The water ranges from 40 degrees in summer to zero in winter. Um, they, they seem to like living in water that's about that deep. They really are a, one of the more specialised animals that you would ever come across. But there's a huge problem because one of those endangered species is threatening to wipe them out. The redfin blue eyes listed as endangered under the state laws, under federal laws. It's one of the, it's actually just been published in a book by the IUCN as one of the 100 most endangered species in the world. And that's not fish, that's everything. Uh, because there's four populations of them and when they go extinct, that's it. There's another fish there, though, uh, called an edge bastin goby, and it is also endemic, just to remind. So that's... that's if you're, if you're the sort of person who loves all this natural history stuff, Edgebaston is the duck's guts. 
The big problem, just to explain it, Gambusia, the fish I showed you before with the big belly, they're related to guppies. They bear live young. So when they have a baby, it comes out fully formed. It can eat eggs, it can eat fry, it can do anything. Sort of like a super fish, really. Um, and they've invaded that spring complex at Edgebaston. And so when they get into a spring, what happens is within a year or two, the redfin blue eye go extinct. Now, even when redfin blue eye were first discovered, there were only seven populations. Now there's about four, we're sort of, I might, there are probably six, but I'll tell you more about that if you ask a question. Uh, we're working on it. And what we're doing at Edge Baston is throwing everything at it to try to hang on to these fish. So that includes using a chemical to try to destroy the gambusia in springs where redfin blue eye don't exist. Building barriers around springs where redfin blue eye are so that the gambusia can't crawl in during the next flood. We even built one out of earth. Moving redfin blue eye to safer areas where there is a spring that there are no gambusia in. I'm quietly thinking about some of these springs further out in the desert where there are no gambusia and maybe might think about moving in there. But the problem is once an animal's endangered, it's actually quite hard to get permission to do things with them too. And another Another sort of trick is to, to, to get a captive population of the species going. If, everybody, if people have got more questions about uh, redfin blue eye and edge bass, just, just, we'll just ask them later, but that's the rough story. Um, we're getting there, but yeah, it's going to be pretty tricky. Okay, just to summarise, because I know that I've got... We don't have very much time. The way the backcountry, the way the desert works is definitely to do with this boom and bust cycle. And in a boom, now this net of fish, this is all big yellow belly and all from right on the edge of the desert. And that was just last year. Because we had two or three years of serial flooding and everything went berserk. It's so noticeable. We've measured this with all sorts of different animals. So if you put a pitfall trap in in the desert, when everything's booming, you'll get a, a trap full of these horrible long-haired rats, which my colleague, Max loves, but I don't really love pulling them out of the pitfall traps as much as he does. Um, <clears throat> you've got to wear a welding glove to pull them out. Oh, I do anyway. And then, as soon as that boom passes, you get this drying bust period. And it literally is like night and day. Okay, so that waterhole at, at the top, on the top photo there is exactly the same one where that big net of fish came from a minute ago. And it's that different from one another. And what we've got to do as a country, and I'm sure that this, uh, when Tim Flannery spoke about all this the other day or night, he would have said the same thing. There are these areas like these refuge water holes and like these springs that are the crucible of our biota, if you like, in this part of the world. So unless we look after these areas and conserve them and do our best, we're going to end up with another Murray-Darling Basin you're just this hodgepodge of things that we don't really want out in the middle of nowhere. And so, you know, the, the, the story of the redfin blue eye and what Bush Heritage is trying to do with that is a really good example. And they've actually bought, just bought a property in, in uh, the Murray-Darling Basin called Nari. Um, trying to get that message through to people is, is why I wrote that book, Desert Fishing Lessons, last year, um, because... It's, 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 not a, it's not a story that people seem to know. You know, people often ask, you, ask me questions that I think they should know about alien species or about, you know, what lives where. The other reason I wrote the book is obviously because none of you, and nobody in their right mind, unless you're a boffin, is going to read any of those. And I think science has got this big problem where we communicate with one another by writing peer-reviewed papers, but nobody on the ground reads them. And, you know, the people, so the people who actually live on the cattle stations who are really interested in this stuff are not going to read a peer-reviewed paper. They might just read a natural history book. And the other reason is because I've been very privileged um, to work in some of Australia's most isolated places for 25 years, more or less doing what I was interested in. Um, and a lot of those stories are worth sharing. So thank you very much for having me again. And I think we've got time for two or three questions.